Hello everybody, this is Jai Cross, and welcome to Creating Sacred Space, our second topic in the series of Sacred Topics. I thought I'd start out today by talking about the word sacred itself. We, we use that so, I use that word so frequently. So let, let's delve a little bit into its origins. Our word sacred comes from a Latin word, which means to make holy. So how do we make something holy? It certainly seems that objects and places may be invested with a sense of holiness, but how do we make them holy? And what does the word holy mean? Where does it come from? No, I looked that one up too. Actually, it comes from a Proto-Germanic word. And on the site that I was checking, which is Online Etymological Dictionary, it says primary, and that's pre-Christian meaning, is not possible to determine for holy. But probably... It was that must be preserved, whole or intact, that cannot be transgressed or violated. And connected with the old English word how, and the German word heil, heil, sorry, which refers to health, happiness, and good luck. So to make sacred, and of course a lot of other words uh, come from that word root. Words such as sanctify, saint, consecrate, sacrament. To make sacred, to make holy, implies that we're making whole. We're making healthy. We're making happy. We're going to investigate this a little deeper today. I did want to mention right at the outset that this Human Spirit Radio broadcast is available in both audio and video formats. And since I'm doing both simultaneously, it's a little difficult for me to, to have live call-ins as part of the show. Nonetheless, if you have a question or comment that you want addressed, I would encourage you to email those to me. A Jai S Cross, that's J A I S C R O S S, at gmail.com. I'd, I'd love to um, I'd love to hear from you, love to share with you, but it's a little hard for me to do that on the show live today because I'm tracking two screens as it is already. So let's start off with a, a brief energetic practice. We're going to do a longer energetic practice later on in the broadcast, but just a brief one to get us started. The purpose behind these groundings is to bring us fully present in the moment, to bring all of our energy, as much of our being as we can muster, bring that to bear in this moment. Often a helpful technique to use is closing the eyes. So if you're not driving, I would suggest you do that now. <coughs> the simple act of closing the eyes helps us to go into the alpha state of consciousness, a place of relaxation, a place of letting go, a place of receptivity. So with eyes closed, Let's make a commitment to ourselves that we will be fully present during our time together as much as we can without forcing things. But if there are little streamers of thoughts or energetic patterns pulling at you, if you find yourself thinking about chores that you need to do later, or if your mind's playing a little tune in the background, see if, see if you can just bring yourself present getting past those distractions. And an excellent way to do this is to focus on the breath. So let's just breathe silently a few times together, 
feeling the physical sensations associated with the breath. Now breathe in the thought and the energy. I am alive. And also breathe out the thought and energy. I am alive. In this precious moment, in this sacred space, in the presence of love, I dwell. Now you're welcome to open your eyes, come back to perhaps more normal state of consciousness. That was a practice and prayer from Zuni Pueblo, uh, indigenous people that live in New Mexico. Beautiful. A lot of times it's not very difficult to, to ground ourselves, to bring ourselves to center, to reclaim that sense of wholeness and health and happiness that is associated with the sacred. I feel that the human impulse to move into sacred space is a very natural one. It is an impulse perhaps best understood by considering our energetic bodies and its requirements. Just as our physical body has needs for food, clothing, shelter, air, water, our energetic body has needs as well. Oftentimes, these needs are neglected and we experience depression, grief, sadness, alienation, guilt, and other heavy emotions. These signs, these signals, can actually be the first step towards reclaiming a sense of wholeness because they show us so dramatically that something is out of balance. So rather than accept these, these heavy messengers, as a state of normalcy, I encourage you that whenever you feel afflicted in this way, that you start noticing what is it in myself or in my environment that is provoking this sensation. Just like the physical body responds to pain by essentially telling us, hey, there's something wrong here. Your foot's on fire or whatever it is. Hopefully we'd move the foot as a result of that. It's not natural for humans to be in physical pain or to be in energetic discomfort. So we try to use those, those signals as a sign that something's off, something that we need to investigate to correct. There's an energetic drain in many of our lives associated with the circumstances of our lives. Some things that might be off or not enough connection with nature, with the natural rhythms, not paying attention enough to natural cycles, not honoring them in ways that would approximate what our ancestors did. Many of us in the modern world lead very cluttered lives we have a lot of stuff scattered around. That can be a very draining experience. When contrasted to the spaciousness, we feel in a simple house arrangement where things are neat. Maybe there are a lot of, a lot of things in that house, but they're, they're put away. They don't grab at our attention when we walk through a room. There's room for newness and room for connection, to encourage connection. I want to share a quote with you from 
uh, first people philosopher. This is from Ohiyesa, a Santi Dakota physician. And he spoke this in 1911, over 100 years ago, but I feel the words are, are still very true, very powerful today. In the life of the Indian, there was only one inevitable duty, the duty of prayer, the daily recognition of the unseen and eternal. His daily devotions were more necessary to him than daily food. He wakes at daybreak, puts on his moccasins, and steps down to the water's edge. Here he throws handfuls of cold, clear water into his face or plunges him bodily. After the bath, he stands erect before the advancing dawn, facing the sun as it dances upon the horizon and offers his unspoken prayer. His mate may precede him or follow him in his devotions, but never accompanies him. Each soul must meet the morning sun, the new sweet earth, and the great silence alone. Well, obviously, uh, most of us don't have a pair of moccasins to put on in the first place. Might not have a body of clear water that we could go down and use to refresh ourselves at daybreak. Might not even have a private place where we could go to to commune with the rising sun. Yet we can do other things to honor nature, to honor natural cycles, and to honor ourselves. We can make these into daily routines or we can do them whenever the mood strikes us. For me, it's a very important practice to greet the sun most mornings as it rises. I'm up at that time, the sun where I live rises over the Rocky Mountains. It's an invariably beautiful scene and it opens my heart. I often sing to the song, sing to the sun, pray to the sun, and open my heart to the sun. So I get a lot out of it. My energetic body thrives in those conditions. And what I'm doing is making my contact with the start of the day, making that sacred. I'm really honoring my incarnation. I'm taking into account its needs and its wants, the things that light it up. And I can actually feel my energy feel, being very illuminated, being very charged, after just a couple of minutes of singing and praying to the sun in this way. That might, make not, might not make sense in your circumstances, but I bet if you look around, you can find something that does make sense. Maybe some particular part of the day where your heart opens. It, it might be sunset instead of sunrise. It might be high noon. It might be mid-morning, whatever time of day it is. It might, might be under the night sky. And you feel a calling. So I suggest that you honor that calling. Maybe give words to your gratitude, to your happiness at being in that place, in that special place and maybe just silently communing. Up to you. The truth is, our modern society doesn't see very many things as being alive. If you walk down a city street, let's say you're walking with a city dweller, and you, you turn to them and ask them, uh, tell me what you see that's alive out here. They'd probably point out other people on the street. Maybe somebody's walking a dog. Maybe there's a cat in a, a windowsill. Might be some trees planted along, maybe some flower boxes. Maybe some grass growing in the sidewalk. Possibly some insects buzzing around. And that might be about it. Well, for our ancestors, it certainly didn't stop there. They saw the sun as a living being. They felt the air and each breeze of the air was alive. 
They thought that the water was alive. And more than a conceptual thought, they, they knew it. That was their reality. That was their world. I would imagine that people connected with the earth quite possibly would see machines as possessing some sort of life force or soul force. Certainly an automobile that they depended on. It's very easy to imagine them developing a personal relationship with that machine. So they would energetically extend some of themselves, expecting to make contact with the things in their environment. This approach to life is called animism. Everything's seen as being animated. Even if it doesn't possess life in the sense that plants and animals do, it still has a life force in it. Contrast animism versus the modern way of looking at things. If you then turn to that friend and said, tell me the, the things you see out here that aren't alive. They might start going, well, that traffic light, apartment building, store, pavement in the street, sidewalk, all the cars, and there's a, a bicycle over there, there's a, some signs, there's a concrete retaining wall around a planting. They'd be listing most of the stuff. They might even say, well, of course, the air and uh, you know, gravity and the sun and those clouds. That point of view has us living in a graveyard. People wonder why there's so much alienation and angst in the modern world. Well, we choose to live in graveyards. That's sort of a natural consequence of inhabiting an area like that. So I encourage you to make seemingly inanimate objects sacred as well by just reaching out with your heart, with your spirit. And it might be, you see a cloud formation. And you, oh, wow. That's a really sweet cloud up there. And just sink into that feeling. And realize that you are having a relationship with that cloud. Again, you don't necessarily ex expect it to speak to you, at least not in English. But you've got a heart connection, a soul connection. And you are the main beneficiary in that relationship. You have more life. You experience more vitality. You make your environment sacred. Something to play with. I live in a very special place. I, I live in a small village outside of Taos, New Mexico, and we're surrounded by sites that are acknowledged as hallowed, as being sacred, as being holy. So I just very briefly want to touch on a couple of these. There's a place about an hour and a half to the south of me called El Sanctuario. It's a Hispanic, in a Hispanic village and it's been revered as a special, holy, sacred place for over 200 years now. In fact, people from all over the Southwest go to visit the sanctuary and they go to be healed. There are hundreds of miracle stories associated with the site. People coming in on crutches, miraculously being cured and walking out of the church under their own power. There's a little room adjacent to the altar that is lined with crutches and eyeglasses, very thick eyeglasses, all kinds of devices that helped people to cope with their disabilities. And as the stories go, as they relate, they were no longer needed after a healing occurred. So that, that's a strong place. That's got a strong vibe. 
And I imagine long before the chapel was constructed on the site, the people probably realized there's something special about this spot. You know, I feel different here. This is a place of power. Very interesting. My question is, if you were in a place like that, without the chapel, uh, let's say it was just an open field in a natural setting, would you realize that you were in a place of power? If somebody wasn't there to tell you, oh, the, the legends say, would you feel it? Are you in tune with your energetic body enough that you would notice some sort of difference? If so, fantastic. If not, what could you do to encourage those senses to open up more? So often we hold ourselves in a protected, defensive stance that doesn't allow the environment to communicate with us very strongly. We've got the walls up, we've got the armor on, and we suffer because of it. We are not honoring our incarnation. Or maybe honoring what one part of the mind is telling us to do, a fear-based part of the mind. But we're certainly not honoring or following the heart. And that's very important in recognizing the sacred as it shows up. Another very interesting cultural sacred site near me is Taos Pueblo. This is the oldest continuously inhabited site in all of North America. Native people have been living there, praying there, farming there, dancing there, doing their human thing there for well over a thousand years. When I go to seasonal celebrations, they're like a corn dance or a buffalo dance, mattachine dance, it's a special environment. The whole plaza, the whole Pueblo itself, has an attunement to these ceremonies. It amplifies the vibrations that the dancers and the singers and the worshipers are projecting. Very, very strong. You don't have to be very sensitive to sense something like that. It's palpable. There is something different in the air, in the environment. Now again, most of you aren't going to live so close to a place like that. But there might be something in your neighborhood, in your area, that calls to you. Something that people from all over the world don't come to see. Maybe it's a, a special calling just for you. But you have to follow that. I used to do a practice. In fact, I'll probably start doing it again now that I'm remembering it. A practice of leaving myself open for a day. I would often do this on Saturdays, day off for me. I go into a new area and just feel my way through. If it was in town, I'd stop at a, a street corner and wait for guidance. Wait for some sense of which way I should go from there and just continue following. Now, the, of course, there were times when I didn't get any direction, I didn't get any guidance, or at least I didn't get it in a form that I could understand it. It might have been too subtle for me to pick up on, or I might have ignored it for whatever reason. And in that case, I would usually think, well, I'm free to go in any direction. But I would really feel into, is there a pole somewhere? 
that's urging me to go one way over the others. And often I would feel this in my gut. Many of us are very sensitive in that area. There are almost as many neurons, nerve cells in the gut as there are in the brain. But most of us have been trained not to trust gut reactions. We tend to think that the, that body wisdom is somehow secondary, something, something that's inferior to our mentality. Well, the more we open up to those instinctual feelings, the more we start to realize, hey, I can use both of these operating systems. Sometimes the mind is the best choice, and sometimes it's the gut. So we, we, we can learn a lot just by paying attention. I mentioned those two ceremonial areas, El Sanctuario and Taos Pueblo. But most often what I do to go to a sacred place is go into the mountains or go down to the river. And that natural purity feeds that energetic part of myself, encourages me to reach out. I was just walking along a, a river today that we depend on greatly because there are 40 families in my part of the village that draw water from a community irrigation ditch called an Asakia. And in recent rains, there's been some damage upstream. So I went up there with camera, measuring tape, and notebook to assess it and try to figure out what, what was going to need to be done to restore the flow. It's been cut off for about a week now. So this flow is very important because people depend on it for their crops, their alfalfa fields, for their orchards, for their gardens, for their animals. It, it's a lifeblood, a lifeline. So I was up there making my measurements, taking my photos, you know, being kind of scientific about it, or trying to document everything because I want to put in for a small grant for some emergency funding to help us out. I wanted to make sure I had all the information. I was very much in that mental state. But then I stopped. I'm walking along a path in a particularly open, natural, lush area. I just listened to the flow of the river. I slowed down. I got very respectful. I got very quiet inside. I came into a place of receptivity, walked over to the water, started just expressing my gratitude. And expressing gratitude even for those times when we forget to be thankful for the water, when we tend to take it for granted. And we think, oh yeah, it's there. And well, now it stopped, we gotta get it going again without realizing. What a, what a really special gift that is. And then my consciousness sunk down another level or two, and I was communicating with the river as a being of water. I'm sure you know we're mostly water. We've got some other neat stuff mixed in there too, but mostly water. So my water was somehow relating to the water that was passing by in the river. It was very deep. It was very real. This, this was not a, a pretend thing like I'm in a fairy tale, although it had a, a somewhat magical quality to it. What had happened is in that short period, I had shifted from the everyday, from ordinary consensual reality into a personal experience of the sacred. It's always there. It's always available to us, even in the, the yuckiest part of any city. We can connect with it. I find it a lot easier in natural environments, and so I try to spend a lot of time out there soaking it in and emanating my stuff out, connecting with it. It was multidimensional. Those qualities I mentioned that I went through in this one particular event are the same qualities that would take you there if you want to go there. 
that sense of not being hurried, the deep reverence for what is before you, not, not a thought of what's out there, but an actual experience, direct experience, bringing myself into the present, just like we did with that grounding at the beginning. That leads to opening, and once we're open, the magic can happen. I went to a Sundance this summer. I had a, a wonderful time, boy. I, I was open most of those days. And it was really neat to see that in the weeks after the Sundance, after I'd come home, I was dreaming every night, sometimes two or three times a night, of sitting in a ceremonial circle. Now, we didn't sit in a circle the way I was dreaming it later during Sundance. But the feeling I had from being a part of this larger whole It was healing in such a deep way. I was experiencing my humanity, connected with the humanity of those others in the circle. And I realized that I didn't know most of the people. And that might have even made it a little easier. I didn't get hung up on their stories, their personality, their trips. It was just a group of human beings coming together as a spiritual tribe, as a spiritual family. Tiyosh Paye in Lakota. A spiritual family. And being there without need of words. And there was never anything really going on in these dreams. We were just sitting there. It's not like we were necessarily waiting for something. Everything was complete in the moment, just, just sitting there, just being there. Yeah, so that, that would be another um, quality that leads to making something sacred, being there. Not thinking about being there, but really being there. Body and soul. One thing you can do to encourage you to drop into that deeper space, that deeper place of being, is to construct home altars. Well, home or in nature, yeah, construct altars. I think of home because my regular altars, the ones that I spend the most time at, are in my house, They're protected from the elements. So let's see, right now I have, I have four active ones going right now. They're dedicated to different things. I work on developing a particular energetic at each one. And if I find that I'm not being drawn to the altar, let's say I go oh, four weeks without putting any energy into it, well, I usually dismantle it in a very respectful way, but I feel, okay, it served its purpose for now. You know, I'm going to open up that space. It might be something new that comes in that is deserving of reverence. And it might be the same formulation. But I'm going to wait until the energy is strong. And I'm feeding that connection and being fed by that connection at the same time. The reciprocity is an integral part of this. If we make something sacred, we are participating in the sacred at the same time. So it blessings both ways. So I would like to lead you on a inner investigation about creating some sacred inner space. I realize that not everyone has circumstances that are as favorable as I do, because I've, I've got room in the house for different altars. My, my wife, uh, well, although she doesn't use them, she is very supportive of me doing this work, because 
I think she can see the benefits of it. And it's always puzzled me, oh, why don't you want some of this good medicine? But anyway, she, she chooses not to participate in that way. I'd like to lead you on a visualization that doesn't require any externals, although some quiet would be good to reach this place. But it certainly doesn't require very much from the outer world. Once again, let's close our eyes. Just breathe ourselves present. We're going to use the power of our imaginations to take us to an inner sanctuary. So feel calm. If there, you notice any tightness or tension anywhere in your physical body, see if you can breathe some light and love to it. Open it up gently. We're not forcing anything here. My butt's a little tight. I'm going to breathe into it. Shift position. There, that's better. So let's start with you imagining some place that you've been, probably in a natural landscape, a place where you felt really connected. And it's probably most useful if that connection was just you. You don't have to have been in the place completely by yourself, but at least um, a setting where you had an individual connection. For a lot of people, that would be a time that they spent in the mountains where you get those great views, or a time by the ocean, where you feel the power of the waves, the tidal movement. Could be time in the desert, feeling the intensity of the sun. But some place where, where you were pretty well connected. I'd like you to imagine the, the physicality of that setting. If it's in the mountains, maybe feel the the wind and hear it moving through the trees. If it's at the ocean, maybe the, the steady thunder of the surf. Whatever details make it alive for you. And feel your sense of gratitude for this place and its gifts, its invitation to you to be yourself, your true self, to go deeper. And do go deeper. We use the physical as a starting place. But start looking around and experiencing this landscape as a spirit place. The sun is alive, the air is alive, any water is alive. The things of the earth, the stones are alive. Not like a cartoon, but they're alive. They have spirit, they have soul. You're related to them. And pick something in that environment. Single something out to go over to approach. Maybe a tree, a, a sand dune, you know, whatever calls to you. And experience that thing energetically.
and now thanking that living being for having shared itself with you, for having established that communication, for reaching out in response to your reaching out. Take a last look around this magical world that lives within you. And now feel the physical sensations of your breath, the gentle movements in and out, the back and forth, and bringing yourself back, opening your eyes when you're ready. That place is available to you whenever you want to go there. I would encourage you to deepen your connection with it or with other places like it. So again, the sequence is you start with something based in your physical experience. You want something that you can emotionally attach to as a starting template. And open those emotions And then allow the scene to be more fluid, more plastic, instead of remembering something as though reenacting a photograph, allowing it to present itself as it will in your imagination. Because there might be features there that the mind hadn't really paid much attention to when you were physically in that place, but that have great significance for you. Realize during this exercise, we were only there a few minutes. It might take you a little longer to settle in. And it might take a little practice to develop this talent. Sometimes the mind skepticism tries to pull us right out. Well, you're just making that up. You know, it didn't really happen like that, things like that. Well, maybe it didn't really happen like that. But you're asking for a new experience. So you really don't want to follow the old script. It might be that you need to make a little deal with your mind. Hey, I'm, I'm going to take 10 minutes for myself. I don't really need the hardcore skepticism at this time. I'm just going to do some playtime. Like, like uh, most kids have an imaginary friend. Well, you're going to an imaginary play place and see what happens. Just explore that way. And that's another way to bring the sacred into your life. But we have to convince the mind to play along, to essentially give us a hall pass. <laughs> we want to get out of class, but only for 10 minutes. We'll be back. We're just going to check something out. Just going to do some investigation. Our ancestors knew all about this kind of stuff because they had such a strong energetic connection to the land they inhabited. They really felt that they were a part of the environment. They, they couldn't mentally conceive of themselves not being in their land, the land that they belonged to. And that's one reason it was so devastating, uh, the, the policies of the United States of herding them up and sending them to foreign lands, to places they've never lived before. Their, their whole psychic foundation was ripped away from them. And they were lost. Unfortunately, a lot of moderns who aren't of indigenous heritage are lost too. We just don't realize it. Yet, you know, if you go far back enough in anybody's line, and usually that's not all that far, you get to the indigenous people. 
you get to the people of the earth, the people who were living as farmers or hunters or gatherers or fishers, whatever they were doing, was very closely tied to their physical environment and the cycles of that environment. So intimate was the connection that they were in that circle, not just with people, but with all the things of their environment, both animate and inanimate. I want to share a couple of quotes with you from one of my favorite teachers, Archon Lushwala. He was doing an interview with John Perkins. This was only a couple of weeks ago. Let's see, it was um, July 25th. It's through Pachamama Alliance. If you're interested in knowing more, you can uh, go to the Pachamama Alliance site and figure out how to see it. If for some reason that's not very easy, then just email me jiscross at gmail.com and I'll send you the link to the interview. It's really fascinating. Uh, John was calling in from Ecuador. He was down in the Ecuadorian Amazon leading a group and so his connection was a little fuzzy but Archon was very, very clear. And Archon said, flowers keep the memory of what they are meant to be, what they really are. No one ever loses that memory of being part of the earth. Really like the phrasing of that. You know, it, it's true. Flowers and other plants, they, they do their thing. They follow their internal programming. They do it so naturally, so seemingly effortlessly. They're not in a, a bitter struggle about, oh, which way do I go? How do I do this? It just naturally unfolds. And when Archon says, no one ever loses that memory of being part of the earth, well, we don't lose it entirely. It can be awakened within us, but we can lose sight of it. No question about that. And a lot of people have lost sight that we actually belong to the earth. We are of the earth. We're not the possessors. We're the possessed. We're made of earth. And it's so obvious when you think about our lifetimes. All, the, all this fleshy stuff, it's on loan. It's going to be returned to the earth someday. And that day's not really that far off, certainly not in terms of things like geological time. When you look at a mountain, uh, Boy, we're going to be gone a long time before that mountain is. So it's up to us to do our best to make the most of our lives. And part of that is enjoying ourselves. Happiness is one of our birthrights. Truth of the matter is, we're not going to be very happy if we deny the energetic part of ourselves, which reaches out, trying to find things of significance, things it can honor, in reciprocal relationships, things it can make sacred. One more quote from Mark Khan. This is actually in a question in reference to a question that I asked. I, I read his book, The Time of the Black Jaguar, which is just a, a, an amazing study. Um, maybe study is not the right word, but an amazing presentation of indigenous viewpoints in terms of things like modern economy and progress and what, what humans are doing to themselves and to the planet. It's a, a short book, but it's just filled with uh, rich imagery and deep wisdom. And I heartily recommend it. And so in that book, he often talks about maintaining sacred fires, that there's a real, real important need for each of us to step up to do our part in maintaining the sacred fires. So I asked him, well, Archon, um, how do you do that? Especially for someone living in, the, in a city environment, how do, how do they maintain the sacred fires? Part of his answer was, 
The only things that can light a fire are lightning, the sun, volcanoes, and humans. No other creature on earth can do it. We use fire to create sacred space, to reconnect with spirit. Then we remember what it is to be a human when we call in sacred power. We need to remember what it is to be a real human being, to be a caretaker of life. Archon and I both, uh, both feel that the, the mission of humanity is to be that intellig intelligent steward figure that cares for the life on earth, doesn't try to dominate it, doesn't try to overly manage it, but cares for it. We have the power to awaken things in our world. And we also have the power to shut that connection down. Much of modern society has chosen to shut that connection down. So when we read about things like exploitation in the Amazon, where the oil companies are going in, forcing the native people off their land so they can make a buck, so they can develop a new oil reserve, and in the meantime, completely trash the landscape, destroy the species-rich area that we depend on for our, our very oxygen. When people do that, it's easy to start making a lot of judgment, say, oh, those greedy jerks. How, how could they do these things? How, how do they live with themselves? How can they sleep at night to get, get all offended and get, get outraged and all stirred up? Which usually doesn't help a whole lot, but it's easy to do. Yet if we see that these people who make those choices are operating from their heads and they've turned off their hearts and they don't have that energetic connection going. Makes it pretty easy to understand. Oh, they're working off some faulty programming. They think that monetary profit is more important than long-term environmental consequences. That's the problem. They've convinced themselves of that. So when we approach it from that angle, it's a little harder to demonize what we might otherwise see as the enemy. It's a disconnect. We need to get those people and ourselves more connected to the environment, more connected to spirit, making things sacred, and then a natural economy is just gonna flow because it wouldn't make sense to anybody to dispossess those native peoples, to trash their beautiful landscape for a very, very short-term gain. It just wouldn't make sense. It wouldn't be done. It would violate our inner values. And we would say, no, we're not going to do that. So the modern world seems pretty complicated. But a lot of times it's just just faulty programming, things, things have gotten out of whack. And I certainly believe that it's possible to restore natural balance for us as a society to find a good foundation again, where we can connect to the earth and the sky and the things that are around us in healthy healing ways. To make things sacred, to realize that we live on hallowed ground, and that hallowed ground deserves our respect. We can ally with it as stewards, as caretakers. We can spend our energy in good ways. We can turn this thing around. Uh, we're, we're going through some dark times now. You know, Almost any place you look on uh, the globe, there's some heavy stuff coming down. And we're a very resourceful species 
we've got it in our ability to self-correct. And that's one of the main themes of Time of the Black Jaguar. So again, wanted to get that little plug. Uh, great book, very thought stimulating. I also want to plug our other broadcasters on Human Spirit Radio Network. Most shows are on Friday afternoons at 2 o'clock Pacific. The first Friday of every month is Maria West with Waking Gods and Goddesses, Embodying Divine Wisdom and Sensual Life. Second Friday is yours truly, Jai Cross with Sacred Topics, and next month we will be investigating Establishing Sacred Connection. I've referred to this a few times on this broadcast, but next month I'll go into a lot more detail on how you can do that to good advantage. The third Friday of each month is Human Spirit Radio founder and host Sarah McCroskey. Sarah often has people in for interviews. It's a very lively show. There are a lot of call-ins, and so please check that out. The fourth Friday is the Conscious Evolution of Divine Feminine Archetypes with Amanda Elowish Johnson. And this show, despite the title of Divine Feminine Archetypes, has a lot for guys in it too. I, I always learn quite a bit from Amanda. She's uh, well-versed in many different shamanic techniques. Uh, she's very well-read. Sometimes she has uh, guests on. Whether it's her solo or her interviewing somebody, it is good time. We also have Jessica Gabrielle McKay on the third Wednesday of each month at 6 o'clock Pacific with her show, You're Already Psychic. And this goes through tools to strengthen your intuition, follow your divine guidance, and live a joy-filled life. That's also a call-in show. And so you can ask Jessica about your particular situation, circumstances, and she will she will connect and share her wisdom with you. So I want to thank everybody for being on today. It's been a real pleasure. And again, if you want to interact a little more, please send me an email at jiscross at gmail.com. Hope to see you next month. Bye.